Yo, everybody. Before we get into the episode itself, I want to let you know about something exciting. Off Panel launched a Patreon at patreon.com slash off panel as a way to help me pay for the show and make it better than ever. If you enjoy the show and want to support it, consider backing the show on there. And now, on with the regularly scheduled episode. Welcome to Off Panel. Yo, everybody. Welcome to Off Panel. I'm your host, David Harper, and this week's guest is the comic critic of the now Eisner-nominated AV Club. It's Oliver Saba. Thanks for coming on, Oliver. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. So I, I have to ask, before we get into the, the main topic that you want to talk about, when you first got that email about uh, being nominated for an Eisner, what was your reaction? Were you jumping for joy? Was it calm? What was it? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was really, really exciting. Um, we got nominated in 2012, which was like a surprise nomination. So... Uh, like this one wasn't a surprise. I submitted and I like got all the stuff together in hopes of getting another nomination. So uh, it was really exciting to like get that email ahead of time being like, you guys have been nominated. <laughs> yeah. I, when we were nominated, when I was at Multiversity Comics, I just remember like basically we had a three person call between the editors where we were just screaming and laughing and it was ridiculous. Yeah, like, the, the, that was the first time I was, like, overjoyed. Because I had just started writing for AV Club, too, like, the doing comics coverage for them. I think it had been a little over a year, if that. So, like, that just came out of the blue. And this one was, like, I'm a much better writer than I was uh, five years ago or whatever. And we have, we have a lot more people contributing to the section that all have, like, a really strong point of view. Uh, so, like, I feel like the section got better. I've been wanting to get another one. And then we did. So that was awesome. Well, you know, to, to celebrate that, Marvel gave you a treat. Before we get into the main topic, once again, <laughs> I, I have to bring up the fact that uh, this morning, unfortunate news was dropped in the sense that we were going to be talking about something that wasn't Runaways related. But we can't not talk about <laughs> Runaways. Oliver, you have one minute to get hyped about Rainbow Roll and Chris Anka's excellent sounding new runaway series go oh yeah i mean i just love runaways i've been waiting for a like return to form for runaways after kind of the the series just went off track it had a really good final arc that was cut super short you sure about the imminent one the imminent and pakali run and uh then the characters are just kind of shown up in different little places, but the Hulu show is coming, so I knew that Runaways was eventually going to make it back onto uh, it, onto comics or whatever, like on the page. And uh, Rainbow Rowell, I know from uh, mostly from her book Fangirl. I actually haven't read uh, any of her other books, but I really enjoyed Fangirl, and I knew she loved Runaways, and I just thought that voice would work really really well for those characters and i also wanted to see somebody that kind of had the same level of appreciation for that series and that grew up on that series the way that i did so it's very exciting to see her there and then i just love chris anka i think he's incredible he's so good at drawing the costume design i mean like he was a uh, part of a round table i did at av club about like fashion in comics so like he's somebody that i hold in really high esteem for that specifically and all the art we've seen is awesome like it's gonna be great it'd be really cool if christina strain colored it but i don't know if she's still coloring honestly i know she's she's writing i don't know if she even has any interest in coloring a book again so yeah she definitely seems a lot busier when it comes to the writing front but i did want to tout one thing i really like the fact that nick lowe cited in the, the ew piece about Runaways, about how they, after Adrian Alfona was on the book, that they wanted somebody who had a really good fashion sense for their art. And I was like, that is, mm -hmm. that's and really good. And could draw kids. And could draw kids, right. Um, I actually really liked uh, that, how they were talking about needing to find, like, a new, like, something to drive the book, because it had such a strong concept at the beginning. Like, what if you find, what if 
a group of kids found out their parents were super villains. The book hasn't really had that really strong concept since the parents disappeared. So I'm excited to see like what steps they take to give that book a like a, a clear driving force. I'm wondering. I mean, it, it feels like it's going to be something Gertrude related because uh, she'll be back on the table. So is Alex because he's just back and around. I'm assuming that ideally everybody could come back. Victor just needs to get a new body or whatever. Right. He's a robot. Death is going to be real temporary there. Right. Yeah. I. I uh... I have a crazy idea. What do you think about them going back to like Victorian era England, or like? Oh, I would. I mean, like they should go all over the freaking place. No, I, I was, was joking. Re- I was referring to the Joss Whedon run that you. Oh God! Of. I mean, I'm. That was that was uh, turn of the century. Oh, was it turn of the century? America. <laughs> I forgot. Uh, but I guess it was pretty close to like industrial England. But like, I think the Runaways should go everywhere. Yeah. Like, I I think it's in the name. Like, they should always be running. They should never stay in one place for too long. They should go to every place. So they should go to space. They should go to Asgard. They should go back in time, go forward in time. Like, just go to the Savage Land. Like, they got to do all that shit. I think you'll just be happy with Runaways back in your life. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, it could suck. Yeah, that's true. All right, well, let's get to the real (laughs) thing. Lately, there's been a deluge of articles going up everywhere from CBR and The Beat to larger publications like The Atlantic about Marvel's recent struggles. And with a bevy of books at lower than usual sales levels in the direct market, a flagship event generating more controversy than excitement, prices higher than ever, and series relaunch is a constant, it's easy to see why. There's been a lot of articles about what's wrong with Marvel, but there hasn't been a lot of articles or anything talk, anybody really talking about what solutions for Marvel's problems really are, short of not doing those things. Uh, so that's what Oliver and I are going to do today. But to start with, I just have to ask you, Oliver, what's your take on where Marvel is today? I mean, I definitely, I think there's still juggernauts in the industry. It's not like Marvel's desperate for sales. Every, but like everybody's sales aren't that great because like the monthly sales, uh, like structure or whatever the word I'm looking for uh, model. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just like and monthly comics in general, like you don't get it more expensive for less pages. Like no wonder sales are gradually going down for that, like over time. Um, so it's hard in terms of quality. The big thing for me is that things keep on getting swept into a new event, which is a thing, a problem that's been happening that kind of happened at the end of the nineties too. And then Marvel kind of just did like, a a really intense creative rehaul with, um, like Joe Casada and Bill Jemis, that whole era. And I feel like we're heading back into and Runaways came out of that era of of Marvel. So, like, I'm wondering if we're heading into a new period of innovation after we've had kind of the last few years have been really plotting and just not going anywhere. These events that happen over and over again and things start to feel less and less important as we're being told that they're more and more important. (laughs) Like, it's like, this is the thing that you need to read. And that ultimately ends up feeling to me like the thing that I can skip. Right. Yeah. I do think that's an underrated part of the 90s. And, and it's something that has nothing to do with the 90s. What it led to. Like, you know, you you look at the two, like the aughts. And you had a, a, what may very well be the creative high point for Marvel. You had things like, you know, Runaways. You had Ecstatics. You had, you know, New X-Men from uh, yep. Morrison and everybody else. You had Next Wave. You had all kinds ba- of... Bendis at his best. Bendis, like Alias, yeah. Daredevil, those Ultimate Spider-Man. Right. Like, you had the, the good Ultimate stuff was really early on. Um, and then... Uh, Wade uh, on Fantastic Four, like you had a lot of really good stuff, um, but uh, gosh, things that the thing that we that wasn't there in the late '90s was the Marvel Cinematic Universe and Marvel Studios as this giant entity, which dictates a lot of what's happening on the comics page. So, and I don't think that like those things are not Marvel Studios and Marvel Comics are not getting more separate over time like they're not eventually going to stop feeding each other it's only that connection is only going to get stronger but like we also just saw it at dc and with rebirth they kind of restructured stuff so that they were really focusing on 
the the franchises that have like an outside reach in some capacity and that ended up working pretty well for them they realized if you put like an interesting creative team on a book it can be good <laughs> right what no way <laughs> um but it's like i'm reading deathstroke every single every like two weeks i guess it's about to go monthly but like deathstroke is appointment reading for me i love that book and i never would have guessed mm -hmm. but they they wanted to do they wanted to make that character popular they put like a fascinating creative team on it and then i started to read it do you think like uh, the one thing i'm curious about all of what you just said is like what dc did with rebirth almost to a certain degree would be counterproductive for Marvel because, you know, everyone wants them to kind of push forward and get more diverse characters and do all this stuff like that. But at the same time, if they went, if they did what DC did, it was very much a back to basics, you know, just kind of the the usual suspects type approach to their line. Do you think that would be a net negative for them? Or do you think that that is fine? Yeah, I think you have to find the, the, the balance between like, um, serving the the image of the character that is the most popular that will sell versus like fostering new talent like creating uh diverse it's such a it's a word it's that one of those buzzwords that nobody wants to use anymore but it creates such like a good idea of what we're talking about but just like i want to see a wider variety of perspectives on the creative side and I would love to see that just happening on the big characters, too. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to lose a Squirrel Girl or a Moon Girl. Um, I want to, like, I don't want to lose those books. But there are so many books at Marvel right now, too, that maybe some of these books are only supposed to run for 24 issues. I don't know. If something doesn't sell, how long do you keep it alive? It's it's just really difficult. That's the reason why people aren't able to come up with like what's the easy solution because if the market's not responding to something, how do you force them to respond to it? But I think that they can, they just need to find the right strategy to do it and the right teams for the books. Exactly. Yeah, and I mean like with Ms. Marvel, that is a character that like Marvel marketed the hell out of it. Mm -hmm. put a really great creative team on it, let that book develop an audience, which is like the big thing Marvel cannot do right now. Like they won't let a book last for like those small books that get canceled after six issues that are really promising. They, they just never have a chance to build an audience because they're canceled after issue three or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it, it, you see that with uh, squirrel girl too. Cause squirrel girl, like, they they put an amazing creative team on there, and they were and everyone knew that Ryan North was an amazing writer, and like people who knew Erica Henderson knew that her stuff was was great too, and it's kind of like if you put a A plus creative team on a book and let it kind of breathe, it's gonna kind of work out. But I, I want to ask one one more thing before we get into our solutions. Uh, Legacy is coming. That's that's their big solution, and we know you know we don't know a lot about it. We know that it's gonna be kicked off by a one shot from Jason Aaron and Isad Ribic. Uh, that it's, we know the line's going to go back to legacy numbering and that it's going to kind of refocus on the broad legacy concept. In all, it kind of sounds a lot like Rebirth. Sounds a lot like Rebirth. Yeah, it sounds a lot like it. So so what's your take? Are you hopeful from what we've heard or is there just too little to really judge it so far? I mean, we this is our third or whatever. No, this is the fourth relaunch or whatever because we had two Marvel Nows, all new Marvel Now, and then all, all new, different. all different Marvel Ferns. So like this is the fifth one. Right. Like I'm not getting my hopes up <laughs> at all. I mean, like they they did they did the thing that could get my hopes up the highest. And I was announcing a new Runaways book like as basically the first book of Legacy or whatever too. Like we don't really know what like what are other series that have been announced with the creative team? Do we know that that's technically a legacy book though? I mean, it, it, that could easily just be because they announced it could it. be, but I mean, it's going to fall under legacy bannering or sure. uh, the banner, especially because it's supposed to happen right after Secret Secret Empire, right? Like when does Legacy it's, debut? Uh, I think it's I could be mistaken. Is it September? I wanted to say October, but it probably is September. I mean, that would make the most sense. It would be weird to launch Runaways right before everything gets relaunched to legacy numbering. So, I mean, like, 
I feel like we're going to see a lot of like really familiar names. It will, there's going to be a few Bendis books. <laughs> there is uh, just like, I don't know, some Cullen Bond books. We're going to have Venomverse or whatever the hell that is. So like, uh, I, I want to be optimistic. I really do. But it's like when the same thing happens over and over again, and every time the, the initial like set of books that they launch is always the least inspiring part of it. And then they like announce more interesting things as time goes along. Right. It's it's kind of like the playing back the hits kicks it off. And then you're like, wow, what's his new track? This is amazing. Yes. Give me those. Give me those Deadpool and the Mercs for money hits. <laughs> I somehow <laughs> doubt that is what you're actually hoping for. Um, <laughs> So I actually have a theory about Venomverse. I feel like Venomverse is like a convergence transitional event. I think they're just putting it in there so they have something to kind of churn out in September for the explicit purpose of like bridging the gap to Legacy so they're not just... Nah. Uh, no, you don't think there. so? I don't think so. I think you're putting way too much uh, importance <laughs> on Venomverse. I think it's just one of those things that they do every so often. Like, it, no. No? I don't think it's you're, you're enough out to it? be a thing that's like, yeah, it's, it's no Secret Wars or whatever. <laughs> It's just Venomverse. It's just a chance to sell a bunch of variants. All these characters is Venom. I was gonna say, I, you should pump your brakes on. You should pump your brakes on Secret Wars. I, are you talking about the uh, Hickman and Ribic one? I loved Hickman and Ribic. I did Secret too. Wars. Yeah, it was good. yeah, no, and this is not that. This is not like, uh, like some big event that's bridging two relaunches. Like I think it's just it's a mini event. No, at least I, that's I, that's the impression I've gathered from it. That's not what I meant. I meant basically it was just like a, a place for Oh. Yeah. I like, get it. it was more but it's not like, like replacing every book, is it? Well, I mean, it's going to have – I think it's going to have all the issues drop in September unless I read the, the thing wrong. But uh, it kind of seemed like they were churning out a lot of stuff really fast for uh, an event that's going to be happening right as the whole line is relaunching. But – Anyways, I don't know. Enough Venomverse. That's more time Enough than we Venomverse, probably... Enough Venomverse, for sure. That's that's the last time we'll talk about Venomverse <laughs> for the rest of the year. Until I uh, talk about that as one of my books I'm relaunching Marvel with. But uh, So uh, <laughs> let, let's, let's talk about our solutions for Marvel. That's what, that's what we're here for. Marvel's in a weird place. Legacy is on the horizon. It's big time for the publisher to make or break the next couple years, uh, at least in the direct market. So Oliver and I have promotions. We're now Marvel's vice presidents of common sense. And we're going to have three to five recommendations for what we think they should do for 2017 and beyond to resolve their issues. Oliver, what is your first recommendation for Marvel and how they can fix things? My first recommendation is put out less books. That's the same as my first recommendation. Yes. <laughs> Just put out less, higher quality, less quantity. So why, like, what is what do you think the ideal line size is? Because right now, I think including Star Wars books, which they're not going to reduce. Is, no, I think it's somewhere they in like have, the sixty they can to have seventy five range. Star Wars books. That's fine. Yeah. Um. Right now, it's in. Isn't it right now? Aren't they putting like out eighty to ninety books a month or something? I I feel like that's on the high side. Uh. I, mm. I, I last time I looked at it was like I think in like the sixty to seventy range. If you get rid of like double shipping and stuff like that. But if you're including double shipping, it might get up there, right? Like, I'm talking yeah. about just regular single issues, because that's a lot, too, though. Um, but, yeah, I mean, in terms of titles, like, try to keep it to, uh, like, 10 to 12 a week. Mm. That'd be great. Like, right now, it's it's certainly not 10 to 12. It's a lot more, because there's not 45 comics that are being published at Marvel. Yeah, I I, um, I go to my my shop and I see basically it looks like every week they drop a bunch of books and instead of like having big stacks of a small amount of books, they're having very very small stacks of a lot of books, and mm -hmm. it's, it's just because they they can't really it's so hard to predict which book is going to connect and which isn't, so they don't really buy big on anything. They buy small on a lot of things, and I don't. I mean, I was talking to Brian Hibbs uh, for something else that I'm working on, and he was talking about how basically. Uh, you know, the industry needs more books that sell 50 to 100 uh, copies per store rather than, you know, shop or books that sell like five to six copies, which he says most of Marvel is at this point. And, and and that's, I mean, that's logical. And a good way to do that is, you know, have a drastic reduction in the total uh, titles in the line. But as part of that, do you think that they should reduce double shipping or do you think double shipping is fine if, if they play it right? I mean, I think they should just reduce double shipping in general. Like... 
I I'm a person that likes getting two copies of a book I love or like two issues of a book I love every month. But at the same time, I also see how that takes a really big toll on on the artwork primarily, but also on the writer. Like Greg Rucka could only do one year of Wonder Woman at two two issues a month. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of scripting he has to do, a lot of plotting he has to do, and a lot of juggling with both, well, more than two artists. He had four artists at the end of it. Mm-hmm. So, like, it's a lot to deal with, and I want I want the quality. Like, I want people to have the time to make something that is really good. And if double shipping affects that, then I don't, I don't know if it's worth it, especially because stores get overloaded. You, I don't know if those sales maintain over time. No, there's sta- I mean, there's standard attrition, and that's the, the big problem is when you have so many other books launching and so many titles that are pretty similar to one another, you're actually like probably steepening the attrition rate because you're having opportunity costs. People have to decide between, you know, do I want this Spider-Man book or do I want one of the other 10 Spider-Man books? Like, it's it's hard to decide, so you just pick the one you want, and then everyone kind of suffers because of it. So, yeah, it is... I, I think that that's, that's a very necessary thing. Like, there might be some books that merit double shipping. Um, like, we might... One of the books that I'm going to talk about, I think... I think actually both of them, uh, two of my three that we'll talk about later, I would be fine with double shipping. But um, for the most part, I don't really want to see that happening because right. that puts out way more comics every month, especially if it's four ninety nine a book. Right. Like or not, dear God. Well, no, four ninety nine. Some of them are. Some of the first issues are four ninety nine right now. I don't book. know if they're all. Like I don't know if they're much longer than twenty pages. Um, and 399 is really steep too. Mm-hmm. Like it's just it the they're expensive. You put out a lot of them, people can only buy so much. Right. And when you have to force re- people to be really selective, some stuff is just never going to build an audience because mm-hmm. people just they can't make the space for it in their wallet, in their stack, in their whatever. Yeah, I actually think one one of the things I was my my first point I'll bring up that's different is uh, I do think that at least initially they should dial the price points back to two ninety nine to try to get people on board. But most importantly, I think that the legacy one shot has to be two ninety nine. If they make it like nine ninety nine, I don't I don't think I would buy that. And I love Jason Aaron and Isad Ribic, and I love the idea of I don't know. I'm just a sucker for one shots like mm, that. Yeah, you're scared that it's. I I can easily see that too. I mean, if I can see it being well, how much was Rebirth? Was it five dollars? No, Rebirth was two ninety nine. It was two ninety nine. Oh my god. See, yes, they should make it two ninety nine. I mean, if they wanted to be real bold, you make that you make that twenty five cents. Right. I I you're was Marvel. actually thinking the same. You thing. are you are Disney. You got bajillion dollars. You are in charge of like half of the world's entertainment. You can put out a twenty five cent issue of something, but do they care that much? I'm not sure. Yeah, if if you really want to bring everybody on board and you really want to like bring in new readers, bring in uh lapsed readers, everybody like that. that. It's an act of good faith to like we we really want you guys twenty five cents. That would be awesome. Yeah, I confirmed. Rebirth was two ninety nine. <laughs> and... We're so funny, it's never <laughs> happening. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you you're jaded today, Oliver. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry, man. I I just, oh yeah. And it, like, I read a lot of Marvel comics still too. Like, and I I love Marvel. It's the like the company that got me into comics. But there's just so many like, there's a lot of fumbles, right? And I'm and the, they've been happening consistently that it makes me really nervous. To talk about the future. Maybe next year everything will have there have been major change that. Uh, can make me a little more optimistic and we won't have to have this conversation for the fourth year in a row yeah <laughs> <laughs> so so what is your next solution to marvel's ills um i had kind of brought it up already so uh give books a chance to actually build an audience so like rebirth hasn't canceled a single ongoing series yet right that's amazing it's been a year so some of those have run for 24 issues um like they're not all they're not all good uh, but like the, they DC gave them a chance right and it put out a lot of really interesting miniseries in the last year mm-hmm. um, like we're getting some prestige format stuff back which I'm a super big fan of uh, like 
I know that miniseries don't sell, so they don't want to use the word miniseries, but I like miniseries, and I like there being six issues, and that's just what you commit to, so you don't feel burned when something ends after six issues. Right. Like, if, if Midnighter and Apollo is is going to be six issues, and I know that from the start, it's not going to be like a gut punch when I read the last issue, and it's like, no, there's not another one. I was never promised another one. If you tell me something's ongoing, I expect you to give it at least three issues of selling before you cancel it, which means that you should be soliciting at least up until what, nine or 10. Like, <sighs> yeah. I mean, the, I think stealth minis cause a lot more problems than, than people really realize. Cause it's like, you feel, mm-hmm. you feel robbed then. And I do think it's like a, a good example from this. And I'm not, this is a good example of a great book, but at the same time, it is kind of funny how it worked out. Uh, the vision was, definitely announced as an ongoing series mm-hmm. and, and it was nominated mm-hmm. in the Eisner Awards for best limited series. So it's kind of like, there's some, uh, I don't know, like my mind is kind of confused well, by that. Yeah. That kind of had an, I can see it because vision was a weird thing where Tom King signed a DC exclusive, like at the beginning of right. it. Right. So it was like, I get to finish the vision. I, I was contracted for 12 issues. So they're done. Mm-hmm. Like that's all I do. And it, so it had a finite, it kind of had a finite uh, point, of, like ending at the beginning, right? Or not necessarily at the very beginning, but in the like early months or whatever. Sure, but you're right. That is kind of shady. It, it is kind of funny because it kind of makes me think that even Marvel knew it was a, a mini going into it. But uh, one thing I do want to say though is I think that the the idea, and I know retailers going to be mad at me that I say this. I think the idea that mini series don't sell is actually untrue. I think bad miniseries don't sell i think miniseries mm. that don't appeal to people don't sell look at I, I i can't believe i'm actually using this as an example because i haven't read a single issue dark knight master race number uh, <laughs> dark knight three that book has sold a ton and granted it's batman and it's a continuation yeah, and it's the dark knight too, yeah it's like... the dark knight but i mean i'm just saying like if, if you had miniseries with a purpose with a good creative team i think that they would sell it's just when you do random miniseries like that are effectively, I don't know, like Prowler. Like no one was expecting that book to like sell a ton of books. And I don't know. I mean, I just, I don't know what the audience is for the average miniseries because I just, I wouldn't even know if what the audience is, is if, if it was an ongoing series, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I think that's part of it too, where Marvel doesn't know what its audience is either. Like it, that's a thing with superhero comics in general. The the people that really buy a lot of superhero comics are an older like generation. Uh, and I mean, I'm in my thirties, but I'm like on the low end of that like that age range. Uh, I wasn't a person that like really grew up at the the heyday of comic shops and that's i mean comic shops are in my bones and going to the the shop every wednesday is just like a routine for me but at the same time i didn't really grow up when it was a super ubiquitous culture that like i cannot escape from ever which makes it sound like 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 hardcore superhero fans are in a prison or something (laughs) but like yeah No, no. I mean, I actually, you know, not to tie into your prison thing. I do think one thing that they have to do, and this isn't one of my solutions, is they need to stop breaking routines, whether that means, um, you know, having the relaunches or like, you know, switching creative teams all the time. I I know that switching creative teams is is part of comics and it always has been. I just think that you have to have like uh, some level of a run for people. Otherwise, they'll they'll break off really fast because you break your routine. I mean, how often have you... How, how often have you picked up a comic and seen that it was a completely different artist that was not remotely similar to the one that preceded it? And you're like, I don't know if I want to pick this up anymore. A few times. Yeah. No, I mean, it dep- if it's in the middle of a run, I'm more likely to pick it up. Right. If it's going to be the same writer or whatever, because it's still a chapter of the story. But yeah that's really annoying but it happens all the time so i just had to i wanted to deal with it yeah absolutely. i wanted to just like suck it up and read this read this 20 pages of less good art so i can get to the next step or whatever or more good art you never know who drops in but uh so, yeah well i'm yeah <laughs> so i want to drop my, my next solution i have is i i think that they need you know in along lines of rebirth they need to simplify the components of the line they need to make the I I think a lot of times their their books fail because 
they just would fail no matter what the situation was. Like, you know, you brought up Mercs, with the Mercs for Money or whatever the hell that series was called. Uh, all the spinoffs of that, I don't know who the audience could have possibly have been for that. That book itself didn't sell that much, and having spinoffs of the lesser characters that were not Deadpool was not a good way to do it. So focusing the line on characters that, you know, people genuinely care for, that have, like, reputation, you know, at least initially trying to rebuild the line based off of what people love about marvel i think is a pretty good safe bet and and you can i think that you can take risks when the rest of your line is healthy and right now the rest of their line isn't that healthy i don't think yeah and as i as much as i like most of the legacy characters like there is i I know tegan o'neill has uh written about this a little bit of marvel's main characters aren't like the the versions of the character that are popular that have been popularized by like in movies or whatever. So like right now, Tony Stark is an Iron Man. Like it's not a male Thor. It's a different Captain America, mm-hmm. which like I like the push to change those characters. But at the same time, there is an aspect of what's happening in our comics is really disconnected from what is the popular version that more people are going to be able to immediately jump into. Mm. I mean, this is, I hate this juggle because me personally, I would rather have the different thing, but that's because I've been reading comics for a really, really, really long time. And Marvel needs to, I mean, both companies need to be thinking about bringing in new readers. Mm -hmm. And if it like, I would love to see these legacy characters, now that they've had a chance to take the spotlight with that name or whatever, move into their own thing. But I don't know if Jane Foster could sustain a, her own series under a different name of like Thundra right. or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I actually had a, uh, my wife asked me because she was reading the Jane Foster Thor book and she doesn't read comics. She was like, why didn't they just make her her own character? Like, and I was like, probably because Thor would sell better than Thundra or whatever. And it was actually a legit question. I, I really, it's hard to say why, you know. I it, mean, like, I get it with Thor because, like, I think that it fit well within what Jason Aaron was already doing. Right. Um, I think that the idea, like, <sighs> her connection to, th- it just, that works for it me makes a lot sense, more yeah. than, like, the Riri Williams as Iron Heart, but in a book that's called Iron Man. Right. Like, just give her her own book. Right. Give her her own book, call it Iron Heart or whatever. Like, and I mean, put a put a more interesting creative team on it. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, he he mumbled to himself very quickly. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I I totally agree. It, it it is interesting that they're in a very odd position because they're trying to please long term readers who understand what's going on, but they also want to attract people who might recognize these characters. Well, and, another uh, thing is too that creators don't want to create new IP right. for Marvel. Right. A lot of them don't want to create something original because they don't get anything off of that. Really, they get a residual check, but that residual check is tiny compared to if they decided to go to Image and create something similar but that has a different name right like this is a thing that a lot of people have talked about i know hickman has mentioned it many times where it's like yeah you don't want to create something that you don't own and especially like when the history of superhero companies treatment of creators is really bad Mm -hmm. yeah which is why you see lots of variants on the same thing uh all right what is your next solution so to kind of solve the issue of not having like their main characters as like the popular version, I would like to see some out of continuity books with like the classic version of these characters. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, for me, like the, the highest level is Thor, the mighty Avenger. I'm obsessed with that book. That book is perfect. Mm -hmm. And I want to see, like a line of those kinds of books that are characters that are really passionate about. And that's where 
you get into like the rebirth back to basics kind of thing. And, but I would like to see it just completely free with con- from continuity. You can do whatever you want for, and also, so it's kind of like all star, like all star Batman or something. Um, that it can be the secret war also like basically things that are kind of like an extension of the secret war miniseries that took like one version of a hero and expanded on it and used that as to like dictate the style and whatever the story was going to be. Mm -hmm. I think that'd be really cool to have an ongoing Steve Rogers, Captain America series that was just people riffing on Steve Rogers, different parts of his life, different and maybe even different interpretations that are not rooted in an established version but that are his character. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that, I don't know if that would necessarily sell. I think it would be cool though. Um, and fans that want to see Tony Stark as Iron Man can get it in that book and get something different. Hopefully it would also be a way to maybe like get a woman to write Spider-Man, like, r- like get <laughs> like these writers and, uh, and artists that don't get the opportunity to take these big characters, like, get a chance to do it and do it in their unique way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I actually have a similar idea except for it wouldn't be aimed necessarily at the direct market. It w- would be in part, but it would be mm-hmm. graphic uh, novels. Graphic novels. Yeah. Graphic novel line yeah. aimed at broader uh, kind of like a young adult series where it kind of touches on the, not like the, the, not even the movie version, not the comic version, but kind of like what the zeitgeist's idea of these characters. Yeah, are. that's like um, the Earth One graphic novels. Yeah, to a degree. But I mean, what I, one of the things I would like to see is like more like you know, kind of like the Thor the Mighty Avenger take for all the characters, where mm. not only it, it, I kind of would like to see it be more kind of digest sized. And yeah, yeah. I, I don't know why, like Thor the Mighty Avenger, you can't buy that if you want to right now. I was gonna, I was trying to buy that for my wife, and it's not in any bookstore or anything anywhere. I think wow. I can buy used copies on Amazon. It's but, completely out of print. They thought they reprinted it like in an Ultimate collection m- like a year ago. Maybe. I, I couldn't find it. Like uh, Amazon said it was mm-hmm. sold out when I looked. I mean, so. that's, that's possible. Yeah. And it just seems like, I, I feel like, uh, you know, a great example is Runaways. Like, I think that one of the things that they should be doing is reprinting those digests for the, the, the TV series because people, mm-hmm. people are going to want to go to a bookstore because they're interested in this. And I think those digest size are perfect for the potential audience that's going to watch I mean, it. why do you think Runaways has a big fan base? It was because of those digests. Those digests, which were in schools, which were in libraries, which were at Walmart. Like, a digest is something that is, A, cheaper. Mm-hmm. It's going to be, what, $8, $10 nowadays probably? Right. Versus... Twenty dollars for four issues, or whatever Marvel's current trade policy is. It's like a travesty how much they charge for stuff. It's like when you collect it, it should be a little less money, not more money. I actually had something similar, but mine was in terms of like they hire a lot of novelists. I would like to see them putting novelists on graphic novels instead of ongoing series, and then ideally teaming them with a comic book co-writer so that they have a a tra- the transition from writing for novels to writing for comics is a little smoother. You get to write a bigger chunk, which is a little bit more of a novel structure. You're not thrown into the 20 page single issues because it's already a learning curve. It's learning curve, figuring out how to work with an artist, how to make your story uh, like balance plot with whatever's going to be in visuals. And then when you already have that work to do, then you also have to figure out how to pack all that story into 20, 20 pages that are going to be expensive. Mm. Like, I would rather just have them go just do an original graphic novel that allows them to like use those novelist skills. Right. And hopefully having a comic book co-writer with them, like somebody that really knows how to use the medium, somebody that can teach them, somebody that can guide them, somebody that can refine some of the clunkier parts because clunky is a, is a word I would describe for a lot of yeah. the, the novelists that jump into ongoing series as their first big comic book thing. They just don't really understand the rhythm yet. Yeah, I've noticed the pacing is is quite often the biggest problem. But, yeah. Uh, No, I totally agree with that. I I think, I mean, honestly, I I think lastly, the the last point I want to make, and I don't really know how they do this, but 
I think they need to spend more money promoting less books that are guaranteed to be around for a bit. So like you're going to have the books that you're talking about where you know that they're going to be around for a while. Mm-hmm, they mm-hmm. don't they don't really uh, I I think Marvel's tactics for promotion are kind of fascinating sometimes. No, and like I know exactly what you're talking about. And like a book like Squirrel Girl which will get consistently amazing reviews. You should have when there's a new arc of Squirrel Girl, you should have a house ad that has five stars all over the freaking place. Like I know Valiant has done that where it's just like in, I think it was like last month's Valiant issues. They had an XO man of war spread. Right. That was just like all five stars and like, uh, like positive adjectives from a bunch of different critics over like a really nice image from the comic. Right. That was like really striking. It told me that a lot of people like this. Mm -hmm. I already know. I, I, on the comics internet like <laughs> th- this that ad was not for me but it did the job right and if it did it for me i feel like it's going to do it for a more casual reader that really doesn't know where to look mm-hmm. there is like critics are there like i know people want to shit on us for saying things are bad and make people not want to read it but when we do good reviews y- you should use that positive buzz mm-hmm and use it to fuel the publicity for your books. I actually think that uh, Marvel could learn a lot from how Valiant handles things. Just because Valiant, if if you if you like gave somebody like the what Marvel and what Valiant just on the surface seems to be doing for promoting themselves, you would think Valiant has more money because Valiant really mm-hmm. like they go buck wild with promoting stuff. And Marvel a lot of times they they kind of don't. It's like they kind of they they drop stuff in EW or Mashable and things like yeah. that, and it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. Valiant uh, is small but smart. Yeah, they have like like six to nine books a month. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just like, and then they they put attention on the books that they want. Like, think about how much they have publicized Faith over the last year. It's unbelievable. Like, they want that book to succeed, and they are creating conditions for it to succeed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, do you have any more solutions, or are we moving on to the next nope, section? We're good. Let's All right. Go. So, you know, we continue on as our role uh, as as vice presidents of Common Sense. And as part of our plan, we also get to create three books that we uh, think would be built to sell and fit our plans for the whole line. Uh, so we, not only are we picking the books, we're also picking the creative teams. Oliver, what would your first pick be? All right. My first pick is the one that I know we have. Um, In common. The same one because. It's at the core of everything. Yes, because Marvel has been less good since we had, since the Fantastic Four left. So my first pick is a new Fantastic Four ongoing series, which I'm pretty sure they're coming back at the end of Legacy. Hundred percent. Like they're they're talking about yeah this, uh, a, a face from or like a beloved Marvel thing is coming back. It's either going to be Fantastic Four or Miracle Man. So <laughs> I it, but Miracle Man like I don't think Marvel fans care about Miracle Man. <laughs> no. Definitely not, but I just love the rebirth. Uh, just like, what what is their Alan Moore thing that they can use in Dr. <laughs> Manhattan? Let's just do Miracle Man. Let's call him Marvel Man, though, again. You can do Let's Alan Moore. We can do Alan Moore. Uh, uh, the original writer is his name. Oh, excuse me. My bad. The original, the original writer. writer. So what is oh, your God. Fantastic Four book? Uh, my Fantastic Four creative team is G. Willow Wilson is writing it. Ooh. And uh, the regular artist would be Mike Del Mundo. Okay. With, uh, I think this would be a double shipping book, and my uh, the other team would be uh, Erica Henderson and Rico Renzi. That, so, nice. I don't want I don't want Squirrel Girl to lose. Uh, it's our team, but uh, Squirrel Girl can't run forever. And if we're doing dreams or whatever, like I would love to see that team on Fantastic Four. And I think that you could do you could have Mike Del Mundo doing the like really crazy high concept cosmic stuff and then give Erica Henderson and Rico the like more grounded stories, uh, mm-hmm. the more fun, maybe more romantic. Um, and I think Jewel will someone do an amazing job with like the family dynamics. Like that's my big thing with fantastic four. I want that to be a really great family strong. I mean, I would love to have the future foundation there as well. I don't know what's going on with that. Cause they're what they're like, in the plane between universes or something. I don't even know right now. I don't even know. Uh, like, I think they're just lost. I think they're like, uh, they're what's, there. what's in Bentley 23. I think he's just like yeah. hanging out secretly running the universe. Maybe he's the guy that's being Dr. Manhattan. 
I actually, I, I really like that. Uh, although I feel like Erica Henderson could somehow still do Squirrel Girl because she was doing yeah, Jughead. she did Jughead at the same time too. So if it's just every other arc, maybe she just has to sleep less. But uh, all right, so my Fantastic Four book is slight. It's different than yours for sure, but it, it's a very classic Fantastic Four book where they adventure and do family stuff, just like a throwback to like when I don't know the Kirby and uh, Stan Lee years. But uh, so this is this is a long shot, but. Some of the people work for Marvel, so might work. Uh, it would be co-written and co-drawn rotating arcs by Chris Somney and Doc Shaner, with colors by Matt Wilson when Somney's drawing and Jordi Belair when Doc Shaner is drawing. So basically, mm. they, they would make it so they could just rotate arcs but always be part of a team together. Uh, and we would always have A-plus art on an A-plus book that is does just... Doc, does Doc write? He does now because I just made him a writer, but uh, uh. <laughs> I, I, that's that's why I said it was kind of a long. You're shot. You're betting on an unknown quantity, qu- quantity there. Uh, I know, yeah. I know. I, I just kind of feel like, uh, given given his interests and given Chris Somney's interests and given Chris's experience, you know, co-writing and kind of just conversations I had with him on the podcast about his perspective on writing, I feel like he could, they they could do a very. Uh, classic golden age style story that still feels relevant for now and would be utterly beautiful in the process so that's my that'd be that'd be super interesting uh that book would be not by it would be monthly because that's gonna take a long time to do right (laughs) like they're gonna they're gonna need some lead in time on that book i'm Um, definitely leading to the monthly side that's why though that they get to work together so they can only do like four issue arcs and then rotate back in and I think that would actually like Marvel should do something to kind of um, make up for its comments about like not valuing artists. Uh, so right. that that could help. Yeah, make but both writers. I have a feeling that yeah we're gonna get we're gonna get a a bigger name Marvel writer on Fantastic Four, and his name is Brian Michael Bendis. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say I, I'm curious as to who you could actually put on it that would simultaneously feel fresh and be a big enough name. And I don't know who that, that you, you know, like, it couldn't be Hickman already did it. Yeah, I mean, I think G. Willow Wilson, she's, like, she yeah. hasn't had another really big Marvel book outside of Ms. Marvel, right? Like, right. I'm trying, she did a little bit of A-Force, but, right. like, I think that she has enough um, of, like, a fan base, and Ms. Marvel has, there's a lot of love for that book that I think she could make something really special there. Yeah, I think that would be a great pick. All right, what's your next book? Uh, Iron Man. Iron uh, Man. Written by, Gre- written by Greg Rekka. Okay. With uh, Sarah Pacelli and Justin Ponser doing Ooh. art uh, for part of it. And then Russell Dodderman and Matt Wilson doing art for the fill-ins or other issues or whatever. And what would it be all about? What would the, what would the, so, the um, aim be? So, like... I've I've been on like a super Greg Rucka kick recently, and I just think he's really really smart, and he's really like he has such strong empathy for his characters mm-hmm. that I I haven't really enjoyed an, an Iron Man book for a really long period of time. Like I I liked Fractions Run, but even that died died at towards the end for me. Um, I liked Warren Ellis's like six issues. I thought they were super cool, um, but like it's been hard for me to connect to Tony Stark on like a deeper level. And I think that Greg Rucka would be able to do that. He also is really smart, knows a lot about tech um, and also knows a lot about like war. And I think like tapping into the, like the internal conflict with Iron Man kind of being an arms dealer that is reformed or I don't know exactly what the word to use for it, but like, basically a guy who is making up for past horrible shit. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Greg Rucka would do a great job with that. And then I would also, I mean, I would make it an ensemble book because Greg Rucka does great ensembles. So mm-hmm. Pepper, Pepper, who I think should have her, um, I think maybe, maybe that could be something that Dodderman does where Dodderman does issues that are focused entirely on Pepper. Ooh, that'd um, be cool. And then also give daughter like give Dodderman and Pakeli the chance to do really cool mecha stuff because mm-hmm. I think they'd be able to draw, they'd be able to do that really cool. Uh, and then I would have Riri Williams in the book, but she would have her own Ironheart book. 
And uh, I would also have uh, Black Widow as a regular cast member in Iron Man. I just, I don't know why. I'm feeling though Black Widow would be a good addition to that book. I Maybe it's because she was in Iron Man too. Maybe. But like... I don't know. I, I also just kind of want to like overload it with women, maybe like Tony Stark is such a like alpha male. Yeah, exactly that. I, I do think it's funny. I, I hadn't really thought of it, but I think the last time I liked Iron Man book two was uh, Fractions Run and him and LaRocca, especially when they were doing like the Stark resilient part where it was uh, just a lot more about Tony and not and less about Iron Man, kind of. Yeah. I really like that stuff. Although, I do think it's really funny that you mentioned Warren Ellis's run, which I'm pretty sure was, like, a decade ago. Yeah, yeah. No, there's, there's like, the two big Iron Man runs off the top of my head that I was, like, really into. Yeah. I also haven't read a lot of old Iron Man, though. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, I don't have time to read a bunch of 30 years of Iron Man comics or whatever. Understandably, it's a lot. Uh, <laughs> so my next book probably would be another one that would be uh, friendly for a, a monthly schedule, but too bad I'm doing it anyways. Uh, so I, I have to tell a little backstory on this. Uh, I was I was having a hard time coming up with my third book, and so I went to my wife who loves the Marvel movies and, like I said, reads uh, the Jane Foster Thor book, and I asked her out of all the characters that she knows about Marvel and that she's interested in, which one would you most want to read a comic for? And I was just curious, and she said Scarlet Witch. And uh, so my book would be Scarlet Witch, and it would be a story about family and magic and the cost uh, it has for, you know, Marvel's pretty much most dangerous hero. I mean, like, her powers are literally chaos. Uh, and the creative team would be Becky Cloonan writing, Bilquis Evely uh, on art, with Elizabeth mm. Breitweiser coloring her. Mm. Mm. That'd be great. I know, and Becky, I, I feel like Becky would be a great fit for that because, you know, she's such, I'm not saying Becky's chaotic, but I mean, the character just kind of fits a lot of her by chance or providence, like mini comic background <laughs> mixed with, with what she does. Oh my God, you're going to be, it's not the same, but it's really close for my third pick. What's your third pick? Cloak and Dagger. Uh, oh my God, yes. It's, uh, oh, because I sent you the, the titles you, you before. You yeah, Cloak and Dagger, yeah. Cloak and Dagger. I was like, wow, you knew it. No, I told you. Um, Cloak and Dagger, written by Becky Cloonan. Uh, <laughs> Right, with uh, Sanford Green and Vanessa Del Rey rotating Jordy Ooh. Blair on colors. Um, yeah, I mean, like, Becky has experience writing teens. Uh, she was co-writer on Gotham Academy. Mm -hmm. She, I love her Punisher run. I just think it's awesome. Like, she, she can do grit. She can do action. But I would have... Uh, I would have Vanessa doing flashback stories that are in the uh by chance or providence style doing uh different cloak and daggers through time basically like if they're the agents of order and chaos i don't know why they would only exist in the modern age or whatever um and if it's like you just gotta like get drugged up to access your powers like you can just have people drinking some magic tea or whatever like uh in like ancient Greece or you could do all kinds of shit with that. Um, so that is who I would want to see. I, like, I love that we're keeping Becky very busy in our new world order. <laughs> <laughs> Punisher is so good. It's a, that's another example of like a character I haven't, uh, like who else did, like who else wrote a Punisher that I liked? Um, Greg Rucka did. Like I really liked Greg Rucka's run, which was, like him and Becky both do my ideal Punisher, which is like silent and terrifying. Like, I don't want him to talk. I don't want him to narrate. I just want him to show up, be horrifying, and then like walk away. So you're not a Punisher Max guy? Um, I've read parts of it and I I enjoy it. Right. So, but I just haven't read enough that like it's it's not like uh, I can't say that I like like the entire run because sure. I've only read bits and pieces of it. But yeah. one day, one day I'll get to it. But I don't know. Sometimes like committing to a Garth Ennis book feels like a real feat. And it's almost always rewarding when I do it, but right. like taking that first step to going through 12 volumes of Punisher yeah. is a little intense for me. You're, you're like diving into a mud bath. You know, it's going to be really dirty and grimy when you're in there, but it's, it is quite often rewarding. I really like that. And actually Jason Aaron's Punisher Max was, was good as well. But uh, so my third book is about as far opposite from Punisher Max as you can possibly get. I feel like you'll like this one. Uh, it would be new mutants and it would be a mm -hmm. book about the young mutants at Xavier school, but it includes the teachers. So it's kind of like a uh, Wolverine and the X-Men type feel. 
here's the creative team. You're going to love it. Uh, it's written by John Allison. Uh, <laughs> our team is Jorge Jimenez and Alejandro Sanchez. Mm, I mean, uh, the, Jorge Jimenez is DC exclusive, so... Not anymore. I just paid him a million dollars. Not anymore. <laughs> um, oh, my God. I would love that. I had also John Allison was was a name that was drifting around in my head. I mean, I'm still still sad his uh, Civil War II little short story with Power Pack didn't turn into a Power Pack book. <laughs> Not yet. Uh, <laughs> Not yet, right? I'm the new editor and I demand Power Pack, John That's... Allison, and, I don't know, Brian Hitch. <laughs> <laughs> God, Who's going to sell a book? Uh <laughs> Well, I'm at Marvel, so I immediately have to assume that Greg Land sells books. So it's going to be John Allison and Greg Land. I have to tell a quick Greg Land story because I think it's funny. I I have a bunch of comic art in my my work office. And this one coworker of mine, when I first started, um, she she loves Wolverine. And for some reason, out of all the Wolverine art she used, she had this gigantic frame poster of Greg Land Wolverine. And so when she she actually uh, quit, she handed it off to somebody else, and he had it in his office for a bit because he also was a Wolverine fan. And he oh, he was actually let go. And so one day I walked into my office, and there was this huge frame poster of Greg Land Wolverine waiting for me. And, I, and it says, I humbly bequeath this to you so you can enjoy it as well. And it has been sitting in my closet ever since. And that's that's where I keep my Greg Land. I just googled Greg Land Wolverine, and it is hilarious how many covers have the exact same Wolverine head. <laughs> um, like they're the same, like fa- straight on, gritted teeth, like face, like slightly elevated. Mm-hmm. It is. He certainly does reuse those He's those got a heads. Look. He's got a look. <laughs> He's got a look. Did you did you cast your books uh, with the creative team first, or did you go with the, the the title first? I went with title first, actually, because um, I mean, I think as much as like I hate to be like synergy is good, like tie in all your stuff to what is like what are your properties and other media, like you have that there like you have that creating a fan base for your properties take advantage of it so i was like fantastic for fantastic for because we just need it like right. we need to have it it marvel feels like it's less of a company without a fantastic four book which is weird because it's not like a huge selling book it's almost like it's like a purely symbolic thing yeah but hey uh, and then iron man because it's Iron Man, super popular, and I haven't really been able to get into an Iron Man book. So I was like, what could make me enjoy an Iron Man book? And then there's the new Cloak and Dagger series debuting, I think, in the fall. And I was like, Cloak and Dagger, you could get a really interesting creative team on that book. Uh, and that's like a smaller property that doesn't have like any sort of um, – it doesn't – it doesn't have a fan base really like people that know cloak and dagger i feel like most people that know that like them probably like them from being in runaways right yeah at least like these three days. times yeah because <laughs> I, I think when they were really popular was the 80s so like the 80s the, yeah yeah the average... i had a power pack issue recently where they like guest starred and i was like oh they were like on the guest star circuit with wolverine and kitty pride <laughs> beta ray bill <laughs> oh god <laughs> so 80s now now that's what we really need is a beta ray bill book um, all right, so you know we we've fixed Marvel in our plan, but you know that's not actually what's going to happen. Uh, I, I did want to ask. No, about... right, our, we we debuted our books and none of them sold, and we got fired. Yeah, <laughs> all after three issues. Um, <laughs> but I, I wanted to ask about you know something that's just kind of a funny trend that is totally not planned by us, but it's just how it works out. Three straight years we've done a summer podcast that touches on you know the different sprawling initiatives Marvel and DC have unleashed to you know each year to fix things. Uh, first year was all new all different and dcu last year it was rebirth and marvel now this year it's really just marvel uh i mean dc's got metal but i don't really think that's like a, a an initiative to fix things they're pretty healthy right now uh no, that's like a thing to just launch new books right like and new IP launching, what, what, five books yeah uh, dark but, matter i guess is what that is but I, yeah i guess it is it's dark matter um but anyways every year there's something new coming or you know at the beginning or end of the summer every year we talk about it 
why why do you think we're stuck in this cycle? Do you think it's just the nature of comics? But I don't remember it always being like this. Do you, do you think we could break from that with where like the possible initiatives they're coming uh, in the future? <sighs> I don't know. I think part of it is that summer is just superhero season. Like, superhero movies come out in the summer, like, free comic book days at the start of the summer, so it works to, like, set up initiatives that you can promote uh, starting around free comic book day. Um, And then summer is convention season, which I think is another big part of it. So it's like, you want to have something that you can tease all throughout cons, uh, that you can uh, announce stuff at. Like, you can announce little pieces by pieces. If something is going to debut uh, October through February or through even later, you can, like, be gradually revealing that information at conventions online, like, and during the summer when there's a lot of traffic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that makes sense. I, I guess I hadn't thought of it as just, like, a a sheerly like synergy sort of thing where they're using what they have in front of them, where they're trying to leverage things like Spider-Man homecoming and, and guardians of the galaxy volume two and et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, that, that makes sense. It is just kind of funny that this just keeps happening. I, yeah. I wonder... well, and they're dropping their events. Like they're dropping their big relaunches for the most part. Marvel does them. Uh, they start them right at the beginning of their fourth quarter. Mm-hmm. So it's like to get those last bit, like that last extra boost of sales before the end of the year. Like DC did it in the middle of the year, which um, was a, a bigger risk. But at the same time, for the first time, DC staggered that release. So right. they didn't release all the books in June. They released them throughout the next four months or whatever. So they were able to kind of build up some momentum that way. That's another thing I hope Marvel does with Legacy, but I don't think we'll see it. I mean, they're, that, that's what Marvel was doing beforehand. Kind of. I mean, like, they, they did it week by week, but I don't. Did, they never really did, like, a kind of three or four month rollout, did they? I guess all new, di- all different. No, no. Marvel kind of mixing up the things now. All, all new, all different, I think, did do it to a certain degree, I guess. But it's hard to keep track these days. So, anyways. All right, Oliver, that's all I have for you. Thank you so much for coming on to talk about Marvel with me. I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Off Panel with AV Club's Oliver Sava. You can find Oliver on Twitter at, at Oliver Sava and his work on AV Club, Vulture, and more. If you're a fan of the show, there's some big news. Off Panel now has a Patreon. If you like the show and want to support it, consider backing it on Patreon at patreon.com slash off panel. There are fun rewards and insider information you can get if you do. Big thanks to all my existing patrons, including Dan Lee, Kat McKenzie, Lou Iovino, Christopher Carter, Nicholas Kesslake, Brian Dickerson, Greg Rucka, Ryan Mail, Adam Heifel, Nicholas Gardner, Andrew Corgan, Fiona Staples, Chris Morris, Johan Barander, Chris O'Halloran, Mark Abnett, Matt Pataglia, Alec Bernal, Mike Murphy, Michael Shirley, Tom Barnett, Jim Dimonacos, Norbert, Nick Lowe, James Kaplan, and Mission Comics and Art in San Francisco. You guys are all the best. Don't forget to like the show on Facebook at Slash Sketched. That's S-K-T-C-H-D. Follow on Twitter at @sketchcomic or follow me at at SliceFriedGold. Want more from Off Panel? Subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher and give the show a rating or review while you're at it. A quick thanks to the band Wolfpack, whose excellent track outro from their album Volmilch opens and closes the show now. Give them a listen as they're totally rad. Thanks for listening and tune in next week for another episode.